So now the second uh, part of the first lecture. Uh, so we continue from where we started or where I ended rather. So I ended by saying that there is a normal distribution around the final size. Um, but now uh, let's talk about what happens over time. So in the previous uh, uh, description, I was mainly focusing on how many that get infected during or after the outbreak. But uh, sometimes you're, or quite often you're interested in what happens over time. And then perhaps it is more natural rather than to think in generations, to think of continuous time. And then there is a continuous time corresponding type of model. It's not exactly the same, but it's uh, similar, let's say, which is called the, the general stochastic epidemic. A bad name, it should be called the simplest stochastic epidemic. And it goes as follows. It's this defining continuous time, it says that during the infectious period, so while someone is infectious, that individual has infectious contacts um, randomly in time. So you might have one today, and if you're still infectious, you might have another one the day after tomorrow, and then so on. And the average rate at which this happened is beta. And each time you decide whom you have contact with by picking someone randomly in the community. And this is connects to the, to the assumption of uniform and mixing. In reality, of course, you typically meet your friends more often, but uh, in this simplest model, we meet everyone equally likely. So each time you, ha you decide to have an infectious contact, uh, you pick one randomly and uniformly in the whole community. And an infectious contact, what does that mean by? It means a contact which is close enough such that if you are infectious and the other person is susceptible, then that other person gets infected. Uh, and then how for how long are you infectious? Well, all individuals that become infected are infectious for a random time which has mean nu, the Greek parameter nu, and which random time? Well, it follows uh, what is called an exponential distribution, but I will not go into that since that's not a required knowledge in this course. So for this model, we have two parameters. We have the average rate at which you have new infectious contacts, close infectious contacts, and then you remain infectious for a, a time period uh, of mean new. So R0 is how many infectious contacts do you have? Well, it is how many people do you infect uh, in the beginning of the outbreak? Well, that's the same thing as saying how many infectious contacts you have because in the beginning of the outbreak, all your infectious contacts will mm. typically be with susceptible individuals. So it is the rate multiplied by the duration. So it's beta times new for this model. And this is a random model, but it's quite easy to show, and I will show some simulations supporting this, that if n is large, the random number of susceptibles divided by n, so the random fraction susceptibles and the random fraction infectious, will be close to the deterministic limit of this set of differential equations. So you should interpret this as fractions. So S of T is the fraction of susceptibles, I of T is the fraction of infectives, and if you want, R of T is the fraction of recovered, but since S, uh, S of T plus I of T plus R of T always equal one, because you have a close community, it's enough to keep track of two of them. But anyway, the differential equation says that the fraction of susceptibles decreases, so that's why you have the minus sign, um, at the rate beta times S of t times I of t. So why is that? Well, um, you can think of uh, I of t being the fraction of infectives. So I of t times n is the number of infectives, and each of them has um, 
uh, infectious contacts at rate beta, the probability of meeting someone that is susceptible uh, is then S of T divided by N. So you divide by N and you multiply N so the two Ns cancel out. And the re so this is the cross product here that makes the set of differential equation non-linear. So it, in order to have an infection, susceptibles must meet with infected people. And when this happens, the number of susceptibles or the fraction of susceptibles decreases, and at the same time, the fraction of infectives increases with the same rate. So you have a plus, so susceptibles move from here to here. But infectives also leave the infectious state, and you do that by recovering. And if the mean duration that you're infectious has mean nu, it means that the rate at which you recover is one upon nu, nu, and uh, when you recover, you go into the recovered state. So this is the set of differential equations. And we see that if you sum all these three rates, you get that minus that plus that, minus that plus that. So the sum of these different um, derivatives is equal to zero. And uh, uh, this is true because the, the, the total fraction is one all the time. So in the next time, the next, uh, slide i've simulated the random um, model and in the same figure i've plotted the deterministic model this is a deterministic model and we started by having a few fraction small fraction being initially uh, infectious the rest being susceptible and no one being recovered and on the plot i plot the fraction of susceptibles both for the deterministic model and for the stochastic and i do it for three different population sizes, as we will see. So first I did it when uh, assuming that we had a population of 100. We see here is the, the, the smooth curve is the deterministic solution to the differential equations, whereas here you see the simulation. So we see that it's truly random and it evolves over time and it doesn't really look like the, the smooth deterministic curve. But then if you have a population of 1000, the stochastic curve looks more like the, the smooth deterministic curve. And if you have 10,000 individuals, they are hardly indistinguishable, the stochastic model and the deterministic system. So this supports what is known as the law of large numbers, which says that a random model with many individuals is nearly always, nearly always behaves like uh, uh, a deterministic system. And if you would close up, zoom in here, you can always, nearly always also show that the deviations from the deterministic system behaves like a normal distribution. So the, the deviation between the stochastic curve and the deterministic curve behaves like a Gaussian process. But that's beyond the course of this course. All right. So to summarize what I've said up until now, distribution of the final size, its exact distribution is very complicated, even if you only have 10 individuals, and we will consider populations of more than 1,000 individuals typically. So the exact distribution of how many that get infected is very complicated. However, in a large community, there are two qualitative things that can happen. Either hardly anyone gets infected, or else a close to deterministic fraction get infected. And we know what the value of the deterministic, uh, we know how many that get infected on average. Actually, the same, we get the same expression also for the continuous time model called the general epidemic. Both the, uh, the first model uh, called the Reed Frost and the general epidemic model had the basic, we, we derived expressions for the ba uh, basic reproduction number for the Reed Frost, it was equal to n times p. And for the general stochastic epidemic model, it was beta times nu. And the interpretation is that the expected number of infectious by one infected individual in the beginning of the outbreak when everyone is susceptible. 
And we also concluded from the simulations that um, it is only possible to have a positive fraction getting infected if the basic reproduction number exceeds one. And I did not prove, but I mentioned that the probability to have a big outbreak for the Reed Frost model equals tau star, but this is not true for the general stochastic epidemic, as I will come back to now soon. So let me end by a few uh, extensions. In the Reed Frost model, it was sort of a fixed infectious force in the sense that you infected everyone with the same probability. What if this is random? So what if different individuals have different amount of infectious force? For instance, as in the, uh, the general epidemic when the, the durations of the infectious period were varied, well, it can be shown that this affects the probability to have an outbreak, but it does not have a big impact on the size of the outbreak in case you do have a major outbreak. Uh, the model I described was an SIR epidemic. What if you have a latent period before? So that was called an SEIR epidemic. Well, this has a big effect on the timing of the epidemic peak, for instance, and the duration of the epidemic. And you can probably imagine that, that if you're infectious three days in one, for one disease, you have no latent period and you're infectious for three days. And then for another disease, you have a latent period of one week followed by an infectious of three weeks, uh, three days. Then, of course, the later uh, disease will have a much longer duration. So a latent period affects the timing very much, but it does not infect the final size. Uh, we are now assuming that there are no control measures put in place. If you put control measures in place, then things differ. But I will not talk about preventive measures now. That comes later in the course. Uh, how about uh, if you have stopped with more than one index case in the model I defined, we had one person affected and the rest being susceptible. What would happen if you instead of one, uh, one infected and 999 susceptibles, instead you had three infected and 997 susceptibles? Well, that clearly would affect the probability of an outbreak because the more you start with, the more likely is it that you do have a big outbreak if R0 is bigger than one. However, so if you go from one index case to three index cases, this probability might be doubled or something. But the size, in case you do have an outbreak, uh, will hardly be affected by uh, if you have one or three cases. So here comes an exercise that I encourage you to solve. Uh, suppose that the infectious period is deterministic, which is what which it was for the reed frost. Actually, it was not really talked about the infectious period, but you can think of the reed frost as you are latent for a long time, followed by a very short infectious period, and then during this short infectious period, you infect with probability p. Then uh, I did not show, but I mentioned that the probability of a major outbreak equals the size of the outbreak, which was the solution to that equation that I showed earlier. If instead the infectious period is random, more specifically, suppose that it is exponentially distributed, distributed, then it can be shown that the probability of a major outbreak is no longer T star, but instead it is one minus one upon R naught. So the, the exercise consists of show, uh, uh, writing down what is this probability for the following three values of the reproduction number. And you should compute the same uh, probability for the Reed Frost model, which I think you already did in exercise one or two, because there you, you, the task was to compute the final outbreak size for the Reed Frost model, but that's the same thing as the probability on outbreak. And I want you to compare the outbreak probabilities for this general, this, uh, this case, which is called the general stochastic epidemic. I want you to compare that with the Reed Frost epidemic. Uh, 
another important extension is what happens if you have some initial immunity, which you quite often do, for instance, for influenza, not everyone is susceptible. <clears throat> this is possible to include in the model quite easily. Suppose, in fact, that the fraction R are initially immune. Then you can use exactly the same methodology. The only thing that differs is that instead of having R0, which is how many you infect if, if everyone is susceptible, this is replaced by R0 times 1 minus R because if this is the number you infect, if everyone is susceptible, then you have to multiply by what fraction that actually is susceptible. So let's say that if 30% are immune, then, and let's say R0 is 2, then you would only infect 1.4 people on average, since 2 multiplied by 0 0.7 is 1.4. And you can get an, an equation for the final fraction infected among those that are initially susceptible using very similar methodology. And the equation says that 1 minus tau, where now tau is the fraction infected among those that were initially susceptible, is equal to e to the minus r naught 1 minus tau, uh, 1 minus r times tau. And for the same reason as above, you can have a major outbreak now if this quantity is bigger than one. So exercise four and five consist of computing how many, what fraction of those initially immune that get infected, assuming that 50% are susceptible and 50% are immune, for the situation when R0 is equal to 1.5, 3, and 6. And the fifth exercise is to say, for the same situation, what is the overall fraction getting affected? So here we computed the fraction among those initially susceptible, but here we ask, okay, how many in the whole population get infected in the later case? So this was the end of the first lecture, and I encourage you to do all the exercises. And uh, on Thursday, June 11, at 4 p.m. Swedish time, there will be a live session connecting to this lecture. And I encourage you to uh, post some questions on the course webpage. There is a specific place where you can post questions regarding lecture one. So I encourage you to do that, whether it is about the theory that I described or whether it is about uh, some of the exercises. Thank you very much. Bye. Mm -hmm.